We are at a new beginning, a point in our life that can be a turning point in not just our life, but our future as well. The decisions you make today will decide your path for tomorrow. The question is, will your decisions be reflective of your relationship with God? Or will you be continuing to do life in your own strength and ability? We are desiring to challenge you to make decisions today that will have an everlasting effect, not just for your own life, but for the lives your life touches. This is a year that God has called us to a year of health. Now, when I say that, some of you immediately look at the physical. And yes, that very much is a part of being healthy. But we are going to be addressing in this year God's desire for us to be healthy in our relationship with him, satisfied with him, and living life giving glory to him. He has called us to be healthy in our mind, our spirit, and our body. Over the next several weeks, Turning Point will be a call to God to reveal himself to us. It is in his reveal that we are able to be challenged, comforted, created, and connected to his anointing for our life. It is only then that we can truly begin a life of health. Health happens when we embrace God's truth in our life. In whatever area, we want to give tools over the next few weeks that will move you from unhealth to health in your spirit, mind, and body. That's the desire of our hearts. When we sought after what God had for us in 2015, you know, I believe like any parent, God looks down at his children and he says, I am so proud of you. I'm so proud of you. But you know what? You could be so much freer. You could do so much more if you would let some of this other stuff go that's holding you back. If you didn't have to wake up and deal with the hurt and the depression every morning, I don't want you to have to deal with that. Let me help you get some healing in that area of your life this year. Whatever the situation is, whatever the circumstance, it may be financial situations. You may be horrible with your money. God says, I want you to have freedom this year with your finances. I want to bless you abundantly as I show you how to use and steward what, you, what you've been given. So whatever that area is, we are aggressively, as a leadership team, we are aggressively going after God's heart for health, for this body, so that we can be effective to the community. You know, turning point. Thank you, sweetie, for being so attentive to me talking. You're doing fine. Thank you. This community, when Jeremiah and I were out in Kansas City, we started to talk about when we were first called here. Now I've lived here my whole life except for college. I grew up in Littlestown. My whole family lives around here. My friends are all here. This is, this is my home. And yet when I left for college, I was never coming back here. <laughs> and then God did something in my heart before we even knew we were planning a church, I knew that I was supposed to come back. And it's so funny because Jeremiah, his mom said one time, well, what if the Holy Spirit tells Jeremiah that he's not supposed to go to Gettysburg? And I said, then he's not going to marry me. And the Holy Spirit will have to tell me that I'm not supposed to be at Gettysburg. Because right now, that is where it's happening. And then she wrote in her journal, Lord, pray for Cor I pray for Corey right now that she would be submissive to Jeremiah, <laughs> that she would grow in heart. I'm picking on you, Mom. I know you did pray that, though, because, yeah. But anyway, I, I digress. God, call, I'm, <laughs> keep praying. Hold on a second. Stop. Okay, you can come back. Isn't that cool? <laughs> okay. So anyway, so God called us back to Gettysburg, and the, the music is there for a reason. Because when, when the Holy Spirit connects us to something, a lot of times it's an emotional point in our life that he connects us to something. And I want you to hear this. This is something that was written about where we are today. The Battle of Gettysburg was the turning point of the American Civil War. 
Many historians agree that it was on these hallowed grounds that we're sitting today that our nation was saved. The Battle of Gettysburg changed the direction of the war and the morals of the nation. After a long string of victories by the Confederacy, the war moved north as troops sought supplies and looked to secure key victories with Southern occupation in Union territory. For three hot days in July of 1863, this small Pennsylvania town that we live was the scene of hard-fought battles, esteemed bravery, and the bloodshed of 51,000 men. When the fighting ended, Gettysburg was crippled by the devastation and the thousands of wounded soldiers left behind. The 2,400 residents of Gettysburg, 2,400, were left with 22,000 dead and wounded soldiers, 5,000 dead horses, and a town, our town, that had been ravaged by war. The American Civil War raged on for nearly two more years, but the Confederacy never recovered from the loss here at Gettysburg. Five months later, President Abraham Lincoln was invited to say a few appropriate remarks at the dedication of the cemetery created to bury Union dead. The monumental speech of a mere 272 words presented a chance of hope and healing. And do you know that most, if not every kid in America has to memorize that and it still offers hope and healing today. After nearly 150 years, what happened in Gettysburg is not forgotten. Under any other circumstance, this would be a different country today if it had not been for the heroic efforts that happened on this land. Now, why is that important to us? It's important to us because t the turning point of Gettysburg was just one of many turning points in history. And God is bringing us to a turning point again. And we've said from the very beginning that we believe that Gettysburg or Gettysburg. Y'all know that if you're from here, it's Gettysburg. Is going to be a place again that will have a nation look to it. I believe that in my heart. I believe that they will see what is happening here and the love that is pouring out from this community, from our community of brothers and sisters in Christ, not just this church, but all of the churches, as we stand together in unity, I believe is going to make a difference as we stand and we pray and we seek God's face. This is our key thought today because we want to help you see that in every moment of your life, you have an opportunity to make a change. There's a turning point. In every moment of your life, there's a chance for you to turn things around. And Gettysburg is one of those things that you look at. That's a major turning point. Not only for us, 150 years later, we're still reaping the benefits of what happened here in Gettysburg. But for us as individuals, each and every day, there's a chance for you to turn things around. And I don't know what your situation looks like today. I don't know what you're dealing with at home or at, on the job or in your relationships. Each and every one of us has a different story. But can I tell you, just like the Better Marriage Conference, it may not be perfect. It may not be great, but it can always be better. And we get better with God's help through the power of the Holy Spirit at work in our lives but we wanted to focus in on something, a, a scripture that, that just sums up this turning point moment. See, because when you come to a turning point in your life, it it's a moment of time that requires a decision and an action. A decision and an action. Because, you know, it's one thing to decide you're going to change, and it's another thing to do it, isn't it? Turning points require that decision and that change. And so we, we decided that we wanted to come out of 2 Chronicles 7.14. Would you open up your Bibles real quick and turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 14. We're going to start with just one verse, but I want, I want you to get there. And when you get there, I want you to underline it. I want you to highlight it, whatever. Uh, as you're turning there, though, I want to kind of give you some background on this one verse. This verse came from a moment in Israel's history. Now, we know that the, the, the story of salvation came through Christ, and uh, Christ came through the, the Israelite nation, the, the people of Israel. And so the Bible tells the story of the Israelites and their struggle with following after God. And when this 
this passage we're about to read came about, it came about in a critical turning point for the nation of Israel. They were uh, dedicating the new temple that Solomon had built for, to honor God. They were dedicating this temple. And in the midst of this dedication, God speaks to them these words that we're about to share with you. And it's so critical for us as a starting point and as a jumping off point. We have it up on the screen, although it's a little hard to see because uh, the writing's small. I'm going to read it here. 2 Chronicles 7.14. This is God speaking to his people. He says, if, everybody say if. if, two letters, but they're very important because that means that if you do not, nothing else applies. If you do, everything we're about to read applies. If, everybody say if. If my people who are called by my name will, one, humble themselves, two, pray, three, seek my face, and four, turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and forgive their sins and heal their land. That if is huge, guys. That if is the turning point. That if is that moment where you look at it and say, it really comes down to the wire. Am I going to do this? Or am I going to choose to listen and walk away yet again? If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, pray, seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and heal their land and forgive their sins. This is a, a powerful thing. Listen, Israel was great in this moment. When God spoke this, they were at the pinnacle of their spiritual life. They were, they were on a spiritual high because the temple was brand new and everything was, they were chasing God with all their hearts. But God knew that there was going to come a time when the Israelites would walk away from that, that spiritual high and they would have to figure out how to walk it out in their everyday life. And so God gave him this recipe, and if you've not highlighted it, please highlight it and spend some time there this week because I think these four things that God says here in 2 Chronicles 7, 14 are so important. He says, first, start by humbling yourself. <sighs> Why has it got to be the hardest one first? Am I just preaching to myself? Am I the only one who has pride issues here this morning? I don't have no pride issues. She don't have no pride issues. I'm the most humble person I know. Keep praying. <laughs> just kidding. I'm just kidding. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves. In other words, you know what he's saying? You know what, people? I'm God, you're not. I'm God, you're not. Humble yourselves. Humble yourselves with me. Humble yourselves. See, we live in a time where it's kind of cool to, like, shake your fist at God and say, what you're doing isn't fair, God. It's not right for you to do this to me. Why are you doing this to me? You know what? He's God. He's God. It's God. He can bless us. He can do whatever he wants because you know what? He created us. We didn't create him. That's a tough word, and we don't like to hear it in the 21st century, do we? Everybody smile at me. It's all good, right? Am I, am I right? Did you create yourself? Were you created? Okay, somebody created you. That person probably should be listened to. In that act of humility, that's where we start the turning point. Then he says, pray. Seek my face. Seek my face. That's right, buddy. Humble yourselves. Pray. Seek my face. In other words, follow after relationship with me. And then, most critical of all, turn from your wicked ways. Because after all of the praying and all of the seeking and after all of the humility that we gain in life, guess what? There comes a point where we have to make a decision to actually do what we decided we would do. We got to turn from our wickedness, the things that are killing us, the things that are eating us up from the inside out, the things that are taking away and stealing from us on a day to day basis. It's that moment when we decide to turn from our wickedness that the turning point happens. And this is what God is saying. Look, He's saying, people of Israel, you got to understand this. There's going to come a time where you don't have a brand new temple and things don't look like this and it's not so easy to lift your hands in worship. It's not. It's not, it's not as easy to do it, but in that moment, I want you to humble yourselves, pray, seek my face, and turn 
from your wicked ways, and then I will heal your land and forgive your sins. That's our starting point today. It's our, that turning point moment. And now we're going to actually kind of jump ahead a few hundred years in time and go to the prophet Ezekiel. If you have your Bible, turn to the book of Ezekiel. Because what we want to do is just hit the fast forward button on this, uh, this history lesson and show you that the truth was that Israel did come to that place where it wasn't as easy for them to worship God. And they were falling away from God. They were actually doing the things that God told them not to do and, and falling into a spiritual rut. And spir- spiritual disrepair is probably the best way to say it. And in Ezekiel's time, a couple hundred years later, Ezekiel speaks out and repeats this message in a different way, which is how we're going to look at it today. So Ezekiel chapter 33 is where we're going today for the last few minutes that we have, and uh, we'll read that together. Once again, a message came to me from the Lord. Son of man, give your people this message. When I bring an army against a country, the people of the land choose one of their own to be a watchman. When the watchman sees the enemy coming, he sounds the alarm to warn the people. Okay. So hold on just a second. So you guys know what this is talking about? H- how many of you have ever seen The Lord of the Rings? Yeah. I love, I love The Lord of the Rings. I, I'm a nerd through and through. I love it. There's this one scene in The Lord of the Rings, and I can't remember which movie it is, where the, the enemy's coming and they light flames from mountain to mountain to, to warn the, that the enemies are coming. Guess what? That's a watchman. The watchman, although we live in a world where we don't have to worry about barbarians wanting to stick swords through our heads on a daily basis, they did. And the people of Israel had watchmen that would hang on the walls, they would stand on the walls at night, and they would watch uh, 360 all around while everyone else slept so that they could sleep, and they would warn if any enemies come. That is the the story, the picture that God's giving uh, Ezekiel of the watchman. Verse 3. When the watchman sees the enemy coming, he sounds the alarm to warn the people. Then, if those who hear the alarm refuse to take action, it is their own fault if they die. They heard the alarm but ignored it, so the responsibility is theirs. If they had listened to the warning, they could have saved their lives. But if the watchman sees the enemy coming and doesn't sound the alarm to warn the people, he is responsible for their captivity. They will die in their sins but I will hold the watchman responsible for their deaths. Now, son of man, I am making you a watchman for the people of Israel. Therefore, listen to what I say and warn them for me. If I announce that some wicked people are sure to die and you fail to tell them to change their ways, then they will die in their sins and I will hold you responsible for their deaths. But if you warn them to repent and they don't repent, they will die in their sins but you will have saved yourself. Wow, this is heavy, right? This is heavy stuff. Way to start off the new year with a heavy message, Jeremiah and Corey. Well, you know what? We didn't pick the message. We're just delivering what God spoke to us. Listen, God is speaking to Ezekiel, and he says, look, I've made you a watchman. You are just like that guy that sits atop the tower and watches for the enemy, and your job is to let the people know in the spiritual when they are in trouble. Because everybody knows that when you're in trouble, you don't want to be in trouble. You, and if you are in trouble, you need to know. Quick. If I got a boogie in my nose, please tell me. Please tell me. That is funny. That's funny all day, man. Listen, if there is trouble, you want to know about it, don't you? Like, we're, we're, if we're really serious about it, when, if there is danger ahead, you want to know about it. And you want that watchman to be alert and awake and ready to warn that there's something going on, okay? You don't want somebody that has sleeping problems doing the watchman job for the enemy, right? There, there's an alertness. Excuse me one second. What? I'm, I'm getting riled up. Okay. Can we pray in a minute? Okay. All right. You all didn't see that. That was like. Okay. There we go. So here's the deal. Try preaching together once. It's it's lots of fun. I'm so lost, I just start up yep, that's that's good. It's all good. So here's this moment where God is speaking to Ezekiel and he says, Look, I've made you a watchman to the people of Israel. And it's your job to let them know that they have caused issues that are gonna kill them if they don't turn from their wickedness. And we're gonna read about it in just a minute. Let's continue to read though. Verse ten. 
he speaks to uh, Ezekiel. Do you want to read that? No? Okay. All right. So it says in verse 10, Son of man, give the people of Israel this message. You are saying, our sins are heavy upon us. We are wasting away. How can we survive? As surely as I live, says the sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of wicked people. Guys, this is really key. God doesn't want us to fall to the dangers in our lives that we allow. But he will do anything he has to do to wake us up. Just like a good parent would do anything that they could do to save a child from walking off a cliff or touching even something hot, a good parent will do his best to make you aware if there's something wrong. This is what God is speaking here. He says, I, I take no pleasure in the death of wicked people. I only want to turn them to turn from their wicked ways so they can live. So turn, turn from your wickedness, O people of Israel. Why should you die? Son of man, give your people this message. The righteous behavior of righteous people will not save them if they turn to sin, nor will the wicked behavior of wicked people destroy them if they repent and turn from their sins. When I tell righteous people that they will live, but then they sin, expecting their past righteousness to save them, then none of their righteous acts will be remembered. I will destroy them for their sins. And suppose I, I tell some wicked people that they will surely die, but then they turn from their sins and do what is just and right. For instance, they might give back a debtor's security, return what they've stolen, and, may, and, and obey my life-giving laws, no longer doing what is evil. If they do this, there's that word again, if they do this, then they will surely live and not die. You see how important that if is? It's a turning point where we have to make that decision. Verse 16, none of their past sins will be brought up again, for they have done what is just and right, and they will surely live. Your people are saying, the Lord isn't doing what's right. Can you imagine that, telling the creator of the universe he's not doing what's right? Yeah, we do it every day. As a culture, we do it every day, telling him what's right and what's wrong. He made the what's right and what's wrong, and we follow him. For again, I say, when righteous people turn away from their righteous behavior and turn to evil, they will die. But if wicked people turn from their wickedness and do what is just and right, they will live. O people of Israel, you are saying, the Lord isn't doing what's right, but I judge each of you according to your... Is anybody reading it? Deeds. Let's pray together. Father, we ask that you would speak to us out of this important passage of Scripture. God, you're sounding the alarm today for each and every one of us, and you're going to teach us how we can sound the alarm for those that are uh, in our lives, the important people in our lives. God, I pray that you would open up this passage of Scripture by the power of your Holy Spirit and that you would allow Corey and I to speak it very, very clearly so that each and every heart can understand uh, today, what it means to make that turn, to make that change, and begin to follow you and to help others do the same. God, we thank you for your anointing, and we ask it all in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. So he, he got really excited there and started going into the, what we had planned, but I, I just want to kind of go back to what a watchman is. Um, you know, he was saying that for those of you that may have watched Lord of the Rings, it was it's the, the people that were warning, and, and they had a 360 view. Well, sometimes, um, you know, they th it was at the top of the walls, and they would walk the walls, and they would have to stay attentive. Well, you know, what is the type of person that would be a watchman? Jeremiah, what is the type of person that would be a watchman? Somebody that's alert. Somebody that is per uh, that, that perceives well, that sees things well. So a, a, a person with narcolepsy probably wouldn't be a good probably watchman. not a good idea for the for the they can do other things well i'm sure but probably maybe not that job or or a person that couldn't see right that, that probably wouldn't be good that's either. probably not a good idea either okay or or maybe somebody that didn't show up where he was supposed to be when they he was supposed to be definitely need to be reliable that's for sure okay okay so we were talking about this and um i i, I got to thinking because god has asked each of us to be a watchman and when you think about that you know, we, we looked in this the beginning verse here. It says, verse 2. Can you get there for me? So in verse 2, if you look at it, it says, Son of man, give your people this message. When I bring an army against a country, the people of the land choose one of their own to be a watchman. Now, that really stuck out to us this week because it didn't say, 
God appointed that watchman, or you should take authority and become the watchman, it said the people choose. All right, some of y'all. Hey, we were really, really high. I think all y'all are coming down off of that coffee. So drink up. It's all good. Caffeine high. Here we go. High on Jesus. Woo! Okay. All right. So... <laughs> Anything I got to do to keep you going. All right. So we have a watchman. We have, we have the watchman, and it's chosen by the people. Well, okay, I think sometimes in Christianity we get to this place where we feel like we have to be everybody's watchman. And although God has called us to be the watchman, it's very clear here that when the Lord spoke to Ezekiel, he said, when I bring an army against the people, the people choose the watchman. Now, I think that this is important because how many of you have ever tried telling somebody something and not only do they not accept you, but they're not going to receive from you? Okay? So if they don't like you enough to have sit at your lunch table, <laughs> take it back to junior high, if they don't like you enough to sit at your lunch table, they are not going to want to hear that they have sin in their life. If they don't like you enough to let your ki their kids hang out with your kids, they're not going to accept from you that, they're, they're, that your kids have a problem. Okay, if, if, if somebody doesn't like you enough that they can't even fake a smile when they see you, you don't want to go up to them and start telling them all the areas of their life that need change because Jesus loves them. <laughs> okay, so, so in this, are we called to be the watchman? Yes. Are we called to be everybody's watchman? No. See, I, I really believe that this is a clear clear thing for us to grab a hold of because there are people that God has placed in your life that that are there specifically to develop a relationship with you so that they can receive from you. Now, it would be very silly for y'all to come here on a Sunday morning and listen to Jeremiah and I share out of God's word if you didn't like us, wouldn't it? Because, because when we start talking, you would just shut down. You just turn off. There would be no, there would be no receiving of what God has for you because you, you would be shut down. So now listen, the people in your life, they are looking for watchmen. They don't know that, but they are. They are looking for watchmen. And there are people that are in your life that how you handle your day in and day out uh, going about, they will see you as a possible watchman or not. Okay, so I'm going to bring them. Teresa and Austin, come on up. I had them help me first service. And, and this time, now they practice once. Because see, we didn't practice before. So, okay. Oh, you're going to actually use a table. That's good. Oh, so they don't see our backside. That was good. Good thinking. Okay. So, I digress. A lot of filtering today. You just, it's kind of like, hey, you didn't see any of that either. Okay. So, <laughs> this is a tough crowd. <sighs> I'm actually picturing everybody with pirate hats on right okay. now. It's really helping me. <laughs> hey, that might a help lot, me too. So All right. That's okay. Okay, so we go. <laughs> so let's imagine. Come on, y'all. Let's imagine right now that this is like a convenience store, like sheets, that you stop in every day. And you see the same people there every day. Every day. For just a just a couple seconds, but every day. And this is how you approach the people behind the counter. <laughs> she said she's like that all the time. Okay. Are they going to choose me as a watchman in their life? Why not? There's no relationship. Do I have an opportunity to have a relationship with those people behind the counter? Absolutely. And the hostess at the restaurant and the baker and the, yeah, I was going to. The butler like, and the baker. Okay. Anyway. The limo like, driver. <laughs> yeah. Some, some of you that don't know us just shook your heads at us. It's okay. Um, so, so here's the deal. We have the ability to have the relationship. And, and after a period of time, if you go in every day, for a month, and the first time you go in, you actually ask their name. By the end of the month, this is how you walk in. Hey, good morning, Austin. Good morning. How's it going, man? 
Teresa, you're looking so beautiful. Hey, how are the wedding plans going? <laughs> okay. But, okay. All right. So, you guys, thank you very much. That's so good. Okay. Now, do I have the ability to speak into their life? Yes, because I have not only learned their name, but I also know what's going on in their life. And you can get that in exchange of money. You can get that. There's a, there's a bunch of people right now that weren't behind counters, and they're all shaking their heads. You can talk to them. They don't like standing there all day, getting huffed at. You know, the truth is, we have the ability to see every person the way God does. Do you know that God knows everyone's name? Not only does he know everybody's name, but he has a pet name for them. And he knows every number of hair, or every hair, and the hair that comes out. <laughs> He knows it all. Sorry, I wanted to make sure it was down. Because you know, sometimes I do stuff like that and then it just stays. And yeah. Anyway, so he knows it all. He knows it all. Relationship is what God is about. If we are to be in relationship with people, then they can choose us to be their watchmen. Well, what does that give you? That gives you the right to sound the alarm. That gives you the right to sound the alarm. Do you do that with a hateful way? In a hateful way? Absolutely not, because you're in relationship with them and you love them. Can I roll it back? Yeah, roll it. Okay, this is really big because I've always heard this passage, and then there's like this extreme pressure to be the watchman everywhere I go and be like, "You are sitting," you know, and like to like to know things about people and like sound the alarm. You know, and then you take the crazy pill, and then nobody wants to listen to you, right? And that's not what God's saying here. God is saying, look, I've called you to be a watchman, but you've got to earn the right to be their watchman. You, people will choose to listen to you or not. And if I've called you to be their watchman, then you've got a responsibility to be in relationship with them enough to be the watchman. You see this? This is The, the responsibility is more than just sounding the alarm. It's... Taking responsibility. That's an alarm. Could listen to that all day, couldn't you? Okay, I have a gripe. Why aren't alarm clocks, like, nice? I would like my alarm clock to be like, hey, hey, man. Good, Good morning. Hey. How's it going? It's going to be a great day, yeah. And then, like, I would like it to have a little, like, like, like thing that, like, puts out bacon smell on the side. <laughs> if it could do that, like, I would love my alarm clock. But you know what? It doesn't do that, right? Because that wouldn't be an alarm, would it? If you are as deep of a sleeper as I am, you have to have something obnoxious and rude and I was pointing at the phone the phone the phone J- just the phone and potentially the table the table Poten- <laughs> I gotta tell you I was filtering all kinds of stuff I could tell I was filtering I could tell. when you were doing your little alarm <laughs> clock thing I was like good morning Jeremiah you look like you've dropped five pounds in your sleep <laughs> yes I want that one. I want that one. I want that one. Alarm clocks don't do that because that's not the job of the alarm clock. The alarm, when the alarm sounds, you're not supposed to love it. You're supposed to want it to be done as quickly as possible and so you can move on with your day. And when, when God is telling Ezekiel, look, you're the, the, you're the watchman. You have to sound the alarm. You know what? When you sound the alarm in somebody's life, when you've gained response, uh, re- uh, re- Blech. With you gained relationship with them, when you've done that, it's not going to be a, it's not going to be pretty. The alarm is always something that catches them off guard. However, if you have the relational equity with somebody that you've loved them long enough, they will receive anything from you because they know that you care about them. That's a powerful thought, and many of us are called to be watchmen, and we feel like we need to correct everybody around us because they're wrong, they're wrong, and I'm right. Well, you know what? If you feel that strongly about you being wrong, you being right and them being wrong, you need to work relationship with everybody you know, especially if you want to tell everybody that you know. 
work that relationship because it's very, very key. Let me share with you something, too. You know, a lot of times uh, uh, we forget that as humans we are prideful. It doesn't matter. You can say that you're not. That just automatically puts you in that category. Yeah, that's actually pride so, right there. Anyway, um, so as humans, we are prideful. And, and the issue is <laughs> when you're having a conversation with somebody, if they ask you a question, there is two things most of the time that they are looking for especially if it's somebody that is com like uh, it's almost combative like you've you've gone to them about something or they kind of know how you feel about something and then they ask you a question to put you on the spot so that they can decide whether or not they agree with you see because people in their pride they're they're two things they're going to either be tricky right or they're going to trap you and this is important because sometimes we don't know how to have relationship and conversation so in conversation, here's, here's a great bit of advice that I learned from the most perfect man on earth. It was not Jeremiah. It was Jesus. Okay? Jesus asked questions back. If you get yourself into a situation where you are developing a relationship with somebody and you know they are going down a path where they just want you to stand on your Christian soapbox and tell them exactly what the Bible says, you know what? They already know what the Bible says. They have already sought it out. Actually, they want to see if you know what the Bible says and then they want to see if they can move you, trap you, trick you, whatever it is, so that you love them more than you love the Word of God. You accept them more than you accept the word of God. Okay, so here's the deal. When you ask a question back, it immediately puts the ball in their court, and they have to respond to you. So if they say, how do you feel about such and such? You say, well, I feel the way the Bible does. Do you know how, what the Bible says about that? If they respond back to you, see, you're already working then with the, that they have knowledge. If they truthfully don't know, then you have the opportunity to open up the word of God and show them what it says. Both of those things take your attitude and your opinion completely out of it. Because truthfully, as much as we would like to say that our opinion of, th of stuff matters, it doesn't. God's opinion matters. If it's not written in the word of God, it does not matter. Okay? Sometimes we get really, like, stuck on stuff that it, it just doesn't matter doesn't matter if my hair is short or long, okay? doesn't matter if I choose to wear jewelry or have piercings. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. Those things don't matter, okay? The stuff that matters is how we treat each other because Jesus told us that we are supposed to love God and love your neighbor as yourself. So as you are walking through this and discussing, discuss with friends. Find your watchmen, Jeremiah and I have watchmen in our life, people that shout out the alarms when, when we're doing stuff that's going to get us in trouble. They shout out the alarm. If and, we and most of the time when they do, they don't say, hey, what you're doing is really unhealthy. Most of the time they'll ask us, well, how are you doing? As a pastor, you know, I rarely get asked that question, but the people that ask me that question, I know that they have my heart, that they, that they desire to, they care about me. So when somebody asks, well, how are you doing? Then I have the ability to talk back to them and say, you know what? I've not been doing great this week. I've actually been dealing with a little bit of depression. And then by asking a question, they become a watchman in my life. And then I open the door so that they can come in and tell me what's going on and what the Holy Spirit says to me. Do you see how that works? This is, a, this is really important. And some of you are going to move to that level with, with the people that you love and care about. You're going to move to this level and begin to ask questions. Just a simple thing like asking questions can cause someone to look at the choices they're making in their life and make a change. I, uh, one of the things that was said this week that I really loved was there are no super saints. Okay? So just because you have been in the word of God or you're a pastor, or what, there are no super saints. There is nobody that has it all together, has it all right. And so as Jeremiah and I learn the word of God and apply it to our life, we share the word of God with you and hope that you would apply it to your life. You know, but it's not because we have arrived at some level of something. We are just sold out and asking God to do something through us. And that is capable for all of you as well. 
So it, it's not it's it's definitely not because we've got everything going in the right way. It's because we're aware of the things that are weak in our life and we get people involved in our lives that can help us and we we hold out our hands and ask for help when we need it. And and truthfully, we need to be a, a church family that actually responds as a family. You respond as a family when you care and you love about somebody. Okay? And, and is, does that mean that Jeremiah and I can physically meet every one of your needs? No, it's because this is a whole body. We are one body. And so everyone in here has a responsibility to, to attach themselves, to find somebody that, that can be a part of their life and hold on to them. All right, let's go a little bit further here. We, we were basically just in verse 2, but I want to come back to Hello. Where's it at? Keep going. Um, okay, start in verse 7, please. Okay. Now, son of man, meaning Ezekiel, I am making you a watchman for the people of Israel. Therefore, listen what to what I say and warn them for me. If I announce that some wicked people are sure to die and you fail to tell them to change their ways, then they will die in their sins and I will hold you responsible for their deaths. But if you warn them to repent and they don't repent, they will die in their sins, but you will have saved yourself. Son of man, give the people of Israel this message. You are saying, our sins are heavy upon us. We are wasting away. How can we survive? As surely as I live, says the sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of wicked people. I only want them to turn from their wicked ways so they can live. Turn. Turn from your wickedness, O people of Israel. Why should you die? We are in a culture right now that as Christians, we hear a lot of grace. And that is a good thing because that is a part of who God is. God is grace. He gives grace to us. But one of the things that I'm having a hard time personally coping with is the attitude that just because we know God gives grace, we can do whatever we want to do because we know he will forgive us when we ask. Can you imagine if a teenage kid came up to you who was your son or daughter and was like, yeah, I know you told me not to. But I did it anyway because I wanted to, and now you have to love me because if you don't forgive me, Jesus isn't going to forgive you. <laughs> Can I just tell you what my response would be if that was my teenager? Wah, 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 wah. <laughs> I brought you into this world. I done took you out. <laughs> this is for real. But you know that's how we get when we really have our, we are so bent on making a decision, when we are so bent on doing exactly what we want to do. And I love that we look to people for acceptance. What is up with that? Yeah, I know the Bible tells me that I'm not supposed to be doing this, but if you can love me, then I'll fill that void that's in my heart that I feel right now that I'm placing between God and me. So you love me and you accept me, and then I'll be good for a while. It's really quiet in here. God wants to set us free in 2015. Dogs go back to their vomit. We are not dogs. He gave, us, he gave us brains. He gave us the ability to have free will so that we could choose the best for our life. And he lays that out for us. He lays that out for us. Do we always hit the mark? But does that mean you have to be stinky about it? Seriously, a repentive heart, that's part of humbling. If you don't come with a humble, a humble heart and a humble mind and a, a humble soul to the Lord who created you and say, God, man, I'm just really struggling with this thing. Man, I don't want to do it. Even Paul's writing, I have a thorn in my side. I, I don't want it anymore. I don't want this. I'm sorry, God. Man, that is so different. That is so different. It doesn't make it any more right. It's just different because your heart is breaking through that trial or that situation. 
And God says that he has grace for you. And he's already given you the victory. That's how his grace is applied. It's because of a humble heart to say, God, you are everything and I deserve nothing. But because you're everything, you gave me the ability to be something. Thank you. And in that moment, we move our hearts to a place where we actually can be used by him and become watchmen. Would you stand with us this morning? I got a text while I was preaching. I want to read this to you from uh, Austin sent it to me. I love this this quote. Um and I've never seen it before, but this is really this is really key where we are, where we are. It's this. Life is a series of choices and consequences. You are forced to be born and you are forced to die. But every other thing in your life is a choice. Every other thing in our lives is a choice and each and every moment is a moment to turn things around. I don't know what you're dealing with this morning. I don't I I don't know. It can be a hundred different things here this morning with as many as are here. But I, I can tell you this. The solution is the same for each and every one of us, and that's to come to Christ, to humble ourselves before Christ because he paid the ultimate price for our sin, to pray, to seek his face, and to turn from our wicked ways and I want to repeat what Corey said, and I want to speak this prophetically over you for the year 2015. You, if you have the heart to grab a hold of this word today, if you have the heart to grab a hold of this word today, you will be set free from stuff that you've fought for years. You will become healthy in areas where you thought you would never be healthy. But it starts with humility. His word says that God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. So when we come to him this morning, let's come with humility this morning. Would you bow your head and close your eyes? Maybe some of you would say today, you know what? I need that turning point in my life. I need whether it's one thing in my life or everything, uh, things aren't right, and I need that turning point in my life. I need to take this word to heart and put it to work in my life. If that's you, would you slip your hand up this, this morning and just say, I need to take this to heart. I need to begin to humble myself and pray and seek his face and turn from my wickedness. If that's you, just keep those hands up. There's hands up everywhere. This is amazing. Thank you for responding to the word of God this morning. You can put your hands down. Now, how many of you would say, you know what? I never saw myself as needing to be the watchman. I've never seen that responsibility, and this morning I'm challenged with it. If that's you, would you slip up your hand to say, I want to take that responsibility seriously, and I want to begin to help others see the Jesus that has changed my life. Is there anyone else? Awesome. You can put your hands down. Finally, how many of you would say, you know what, I've been going about it all wrong? <laughs> or maybe I've just missed that relational element in my life, and now I can see that God has called me to be the watchman in the lives of my family and my friends and the people that I care about, but I need to build that relationship. If that's you, would you slip your hand up to say, I'm walking away from the old way of doing it, and I'm going to begin to dig into relationship so that I have the right to speak in their lives. Is there anyone else? These are big decisions that you're making today. Now, if you raise your hand for any of them, would you just slip both hands up to the, the, the Lord this morning? And just with humility and sincerity, right where you are, I just want you to whisper a prayer of your own. We're just going to take a few minutes and just whisper a prayer of our own this morning and just ask Him to, to come and move on your behalf. Come on, let me hear you pray this morning. Let me hear the saints pray this morning and call out to God regarding your 
your position, wherever it is. God, make me the watchman. God, help me to be in relationship with the people that you've called me to. Help my words to matter to them. It already matters to you, but God, help the, my words to matter to, you, to them as well because I'm speaking your words. God, help me to make a change in my life this morning. Help me to humble myself. I deal with pride, God. Help me to, to, to humble myself under the mighty hand of God. Help me to pray more. Help me to seek your face, God. And we thank you, God, for your work in this place today. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen.